Okay, so good evening, everyone. How's everyone? Okay, I see somebody's talking still there. Okay. Um, okay, so today we're going to look at uh, another popular technique. So last time we looked at uh, gradient boosted addition trees. So today we look at random forests. And then also a third popular technique, which is support vector machines. Okay. So, um, and in between, we'll also see another model called multivariate adaptive regression splines. So you might have not have heard of it. You might not have heard about it, but that's fine. I mean, it's yet another model, nonlinear model. It's just a way to motivate how to design new models. Okay. Um, so in terms of uh, goals for today's lecture, it's going to be first, what is what is bagging? Uh, it's it's a simple extension to uh, bootstrap method that you've already seen before. So we look at bagging and then. Uh, contrast it with random forest. So random forest is going to be very similar to the idea of bagging, OK? And uh, how they improve over uh, a single tree, single decision tree. Uh, second point is, uh, I guess, uh, very important as well, which is that how to understand uh, how your nonlinear models are working, right? So it's somewhat difficult to understand how your methods are working. So for tree methods, uh, there is this uh, technique of uh, variable importance uh, scores that you can assign to variables. So we look at uh, intuitively what do they what, what are they doing okay, for tree methods. And there's also uh, another way of diagnosing your uh, uh, nonlinear model, which is uh, through partial dependence plots. Okay. So um, we look at those two ways to understand what's happening with nonlinear non -linear methods. Um, and the third goal will be to kind of understand how uh, Mars or multivariate adaptive regression splines are constructed. Okay, so there it's just a, the goal is to not understand. You know, not like uh, you may not really use it eventually. You know, depending on uh, the application, but uh, you want to see how things are constructed. Okay, so you can actually do similar constructions uh, for your own domains. Actually, you don't have to stick with classical uh, decision trees or random forests or um, support vector machines, OK? You can actually build your own models with slight tweaks. Uh, the last point is uh, going to be uh, is going to be a very important aspect, which is uh, motivating a loss function, which is geometric in nature, OK? So we have, be, we have been thinking about loss functions from uh, some sort of a reconstruction error, right? Some sort of a, like a least square loss is like, how, how well is f of x close to y or cross entropy loss? So the loss function for support vector machine will be motivated from a geometric perspective. So that's going to be the uh, key idea in that part of the lecture. Okay. Any questions uh, before we start? Is the so last time how many of you did not understand gradient boosted decision trees? <laughs> okay. So it's a good time to have a look at it before you completely forget the lecture from last time. Uh, the idea is. Uh, you know, is the use of a uh, notion of a gradient update. Okay, so you've already seen gradient descent, right? You already know if I have a previous estimate, then I, you know, subtract, you know, some constant times uh, gradient of uh, maybe the objective, whatever the loss with respect to that estimate, right? So a similar form is uh, also uh, underlies these, this uh, notion of gradients as targets for a new decision tree to be added to your uh, ag aggregate model. Okay, so you're adding a new tree. But to add to the add, add a new tree to your uh, additive model, uh, the new tree is going to predict not the targets itself, but the uh, gradients of the loss with respect to the uh, with respect to uh, the function. You know the previous model. Okay, so there's going to be n dimensional gradient. So there's going to be n numbers, just like the targets, which are n numbers. If you have n data, uh, n amount of data. So those n numbers will be gradients now. Okay, and that's it. That given that you will train your tree tree, and then you add the tree to your uh, additive model, okay. So that's why. That, so that's a gradient way of boosting. Boosting just is like additive models, okay. Um, so okay, let's start with the first idea, which is the idea of bagging. So try to recall what we did with uh, Bootstrap, right? Okay. So bagging itself is an interesting technique, uh, which is a wrapper around uh, models that you already seen. Okay, so pick. Uh, so remember, in Bootstrap, we had an original data set Z, and then we created Bootstrap samples Z star one, uh, all the way to 
z star b, right? So what is what is z? Uh, it is just uh, x comma y. Okay. So with the tag at the top, which represents this, this is the data. Okay. Uh, which is this is this is n times p, and this is uh, let's say n times one for simplicity. Okay. So given these bootstrap uh, samples, for each sample we all have we have already seen this before. We could construct uh, f star one of uh, x all the way to f star b of x, right? We can construct b such models, capital B number of models, maybe 50 of them. And uh, bagging is simply taking an average of these uh, models, OK? So So this is a this is a bagging uh, uh, model. So given any base set of models, think of decision trees or uh, anything else. So you just uh, average the predictions, okay? And uh, if it's a classification problem, you would do something slightly different. You'd maybe take majority vote and uh, uh, predict that as the uh, uh, prediction, okay? So. Okay. So. So what is the uh, so what is bagging uh, getting us like what is it, what is it doing compared to directly building a model from Z itself right I can I can construct a f of x right f of x let's say f uh, baseline okay so what's the difference between these two is what we'll try to motivate and uh, yeah. And to do so, I want to uh, take a step back and talk about just random variables. So let me do that first. Okay. Let's say there are a bunch of random variables, w1 to wb, okay, which are i, id, okay. Is this a short form for saying uh, independent and identically distributed, okay. Think of all of them coming from, let's say, Gaussian. Let's say the standard Gaussian. So W1 is a random variable which is uh, standard Gaussian. W2 is a random variable which is standard Gaussian, and so on. There are B of them, OK? And uh, independence, so remember, what does independence mean uh, from the refresher course, let's say? It's just probability of uh, you know x, x, OK, I don't want to use x. Um, W1, W2 is just probability of uh, W1 times probability of W2, OK? And, uh, so if, the, if let's say the random variables are independent, then uh, and identically distributed just means that the means are all the same, okay? And not just the means, but they have the same distribution anyway. Uh, so what is the variance of their average? Okay, so one by b, sum over i is equal to one to b of uh, I guess i. What is the variance of their average? So let's say the IID with some uh, mean being uh, mu and variance being sigma square, let's say. What do you think is the variance of their average? Sigma square by b squared? Yeah, huh? it's not mu by v, but uh, it's uh, sigma squared by b squared. So let's see. I mean, we can work it out. We don't have to memorize anything. So it's basically just, uh, so let's forget the factor 1 by b. So it's a bunch of sum of random variables. They're independent. So variance of, uh, let's say, two independent random variables is the variance of first one plus the variance of the second one, OK? So there are b of them. So uh, then I get uh, sum over i is equal to 1 to b of the variance of uh, each one, OK? Because they're independent, I have forgotten the first, you know, factor one by b, and we know that you know if variance of uh, uh, a random variable and the variance of a scale version of the random variable are related by a square uh, factor. Okay, which just means that um, you know variance of uh, a times z 
is uh, I don't want to use z. Let's change it to uh, a times v is uh, a square times variance of v. Okay. So in this case, I can just do uh, one by b square. Okay. The factor in the front is one by b, so one by b square. So if you just look at this, then that's just sigma square by b. Okay. So there is variance reduction happening, okay, when I average a bunch of random variables, right? Uh, so what is it? No, there's sum over b here, which will give a factor of b. So b times sigma square divided by b square, okay? Uh, so that's fine. So this is good, okay. So what? So now let's consider the case where uh, W1 to WB are actually not IID, but uh, they're identically distributed, but they have a correlation uh, between WI and WJ is rho, okay. So rho is some Greek symbols, just think of it as like, they are correlated with let's say 0.5, okay. Correlation value being 0.5. Now, we can use the same idea. We can use the same idea, except that, uh, you know, let's not worry about this factor. This factor just gives us a one by b square here. So variance of the sum of these b random variables, okay? Variance of the, you know, let's say one by b square, sum of i is equal to one to b of uh, wi, okay? This has, uh, you know, you can write the definition of the variance. Variance is nothing but the random variable minus its uh, expectation, the whole square, right? Um, so you, if, you, if you expand this out, and we're not gonna do the laborious derivation of uh, expanding it out, but it turns out, so one by b squared was always there as a factor. It's gonna be the sum over i is equal to one to b of the variance of uh, wi plus two times sum over i is equal to one to b and sum over j is equal to one to i minus one of the, I guess, covariance of uh, wi, wj. It's like a plus b the whole square. I am expanding it, so there's some. There's going to be a square term, b square term, and then two ab. So it's this term is like the two ab term. Okay, there are a lot more than just two a and b. Think of a plus b plus c the whole square. Okay, if you expand it out, you'll get a bunch of product terms like this. Okay, like products of uh, pairs of uh, pairs of things. Okay, so this is the uh, variance. Now, okay. So this is variance, this is this is correlation by the way, and this is covariance. The relation between them is uh, just uh, uh, just a scaling factor of one by, in this case, one by sigma square, okay. One by sigma square. So let's, uh, let's substitute what we know. So one by b square, and the first term is uh, b times sigma square that we saw from the first uh, IID version of the problem itself, okay. Plus two times, now this double summation, you know, is gonna be something like b times b minus one by two, okay? This is just a sum over, it's like uh, the sum of first n uh, natural numbers, okay? Sum of one plus two plus three plus four is four times three by two, okay? That's it. Uh, times uh, the covariance, is, as I said, sigma square times rho. Okay. Now you can see uh, roughly, you know, you can see what the, what the effect is. So, which is equal to sigma square by B plus b minus one by b times uh, rho times sigma square, okay?
yeah so this b minus 1 by b just ignore it because let's say b is 50 then it's 49 by 50 which is almost 1 so for us b is like a constant let's say i'm i'm adding 50 random variables okay so doesn't matter let's say let's ignore this uh, i mean it's close to 1 so let's ignore this so now you can see that as i have uh, b random variables their variance of their sum okay has essentially two terms one term is actually dying with respect to uh, b as in like as you have b is uh, instead of 50 you make it 100 then the first term is like even smaller okay but the second term if you make b to be 50 to 100 you know the first the b minus 1 by b is kind of irrelevant the second term is not scaling down at all okay it's uh, it's almost it's it's the same okay there's no as you increase b the second term is not uh, dying down okay so if you have correlated random variables if you just average them you're not going to kill the variance of the averaged quantity okay is the is the point clear just in terms of random variables yeah no i'm just saying that uh, we are looking at the average quantities right so average of a bunch of random variables if they're independent uh, and identically distributed identically distributed is not very necessary but they're independent then the variance kind of dies down you know variance is smaller okay whereas if they are not independent in this case in let's say correlated with some you know some correlation value rho let's say 0.5 then the variance doesn't uh, get you know when you average those random variables the variance is still high i mean it depends on uh, what the rho is but it there is some non negligible effect if they are correlated okay which doesn't uh, get uh, you know which doesn't become small so if in the first case as b is increasing i get zero variance almost like uh, variance is going to zero the second case the variance is not going to zero the variance is going to sigma uh, sorry this rho times uh, sigma square okay so that's all that's there's a difference between averaging correlated random variables and averaging uh, independent random variables okay so why is the story relevant for bagging okay so bagging we are averaging okay we are averaging a bunch of uh, let's say decision trees okay the predictions of decision trees uh, they are all derived from the same data okay so they are all correlated okay so which means that um, you are not uh, you are not having the intended effect by averaging the uh, predictions okay what is the intended effect of bagging uh, it's trying to reduce the variance of your prediction okay that's the internet effect of bagging reduce the variance of your prediction uh, you're not able to do that if you have correlation and the correlation is naturally there because they are all from the same same data you had the same data you just randomized by adding some you know by creating this bootstrap sample with with replacement whatever and you had different potentially different models but they're all correlated because they're all from this originally is from the same data they're not independent. If think of separate separate data sets uh, and creating models and then averaging, then you would uh, have some variance reduction nicely, as in the first case. Uh, in the in the bagging case, you I mean in, in general you will not have multiple data sets. You only have one data set. So things are all correlated. So that's why even though your objective with bagging is to reduce variance of your predictions, you'll not be able to achieve it. Okay. I mean you'll be able to achieve it to some level, of course. You see the first term. So. What is sampling error? Yes. Like if you are taking multiple samples, your prediction would be different each time. So it is kind of averaging it out. So yes, it is averaging. Yes. Would be low. No, it's averaging out, but I don't understand what is meant by sampling error. So if you are taking multiple samples from even the same data set, your predictions would be different each time. So yes. It will increase the variance, right? But since it may it may have different predictions, but I'm averaging, yeah, which is supposed to have lower variance. Now, what is what is sampling error? I didn't. I don't know. What are you thinking of? So basically, when you are taking multiple samples from the same data set, each time your prediction could be different. 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 Yes. So in bagging, it is just bringing it closer to the average value rather than. Yeah, the average is a prediction. Yes. So that is how it is reducing the sampling error. I don't know what sampling error is. Uh, <laughs> we can discuss it during the break. Uh, Okay, so I mean, so okay, why is all this? This is a stepping stone towards talking about random forest. Okay, so bagging, of course, helps. You should probably do that if you want, if you care about reducing variance. Um, but you can, but it's not enough uh, because it's using the same data. So maybe variance is not really dying down. So 
the idea is to further decrease the variance okay by trying to have uncorrelated uh, trees as an uncorrelated prediction function so the, remember in bagging uh, we had uh, f star i right uh, f star 1 all the way to f star b right these are correlated because you know they are sampling with replacement uh, and from the same data that's fine we'll try to further decorrelate these guys okay let's say these guys are decision trees okay we're going to further decorrelate and that's the idea of random forest okay um, and hope and the hope is that if you further decorrelated the, the row i mean it's not exactly i mean the previous thing was just for random variables and intuition for intuition the row is hopefully lower because these are hopefully decorrelated and so uh, then you have further reduction in variance okay uh, Yeah. So, how many of you have already worked with random forest before? So, I don't know when. Okay, majority of you on this side. Who has not worked with random forest? So, you know how to use random forest, but uh, uh, I'll spend a minute on what the random forest description is because since you already know what random forest is, uh, I'll just do the diff with respect to b bagging. Okay, uh, and uh, we'll move forward. Okay. To, yeah. So, can you use other techniques to uh, to get rid of some of the variance before you run it through the tree, like uh, I don't know, the PCA or something like that? Yes. Then yes. Your trees yeah. Using bagging. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You can you can always do any pre-processing tasks. Uh, remember, if you do pre-processing, uh, then hopefully it's within a cross-validation loop. If you can afford a cross-validation loop, so that you are not biased. You know, then your estimates of error will be off. Okay, just a model of that fact, you should be fine with any pre-processing step too. Uh, there are many variance reduction techniques. Here, it's not so much about, uh, I mean, so the motivation was bagging is anyway trying to reduce the prediction uh, variance and uh, random forest is further taking that taking that care into, sorry, taking that step, step further by decorrelating the trees. Okay, that's the, I guess, the storyline. Yeah. Reduce the variance of the prediction. Reprocessing is basically for the variable correlation reduction. Yeah. It's kind of completely unrelated thing. PCA is doing. No, I mean, the data, uh, you know, is a bunch of columns of each variables, right? So you could uh, uh, reduce some variance in that data. So you're reducing the variance between the predictors. Sure. But I mean, not between the predictors. Variance. Okay. This is a, okay. We are reducing the, uh, we are somehow the like. Variance. We are reducing Uh, it's not about reducing variance, right? It's somehow like taking, getting noise no, out I'm of the picture. Not I'm saying we are reducing the correlation between variables, right? Uh, we'll get to PCA, but the short answer is the objective of PCA is not to uh, do what you said, like reduce the correlation. It's a variable reduction technique. Uh, sure. But your point is correct that, uh, you know, PCA is doing something else, which is, which is trying to work, you know, forget about the models. It's just trying to work with data and trying to do something about the data, like trying to remove noise, useless, useless features, essentially. Here we are not doing that. Okay, here we are doing something else. Uh, here we are, we have the data already. Data is not being touched, and we are now trying to uh, reduce the variance in our predictions uh, via, uh, you know, if we are using averaging methods. Averaging itself reduces variance. We are trying to say, okay, it may not reduce variance if things are correlated. So let's do something. To decorrelate the uh, individual uh, individual elements in this case uh, uh, via you know that's essentially what random forest is okay uh, so that's that's fine okay so you have these uh, b uh, so okay so let's let me directly get into random forest okay just the one minute uh, summary which you've already seen so. So what you do uh, at least you know there are different ways to get the same outcome so this is one description of it. So you again create bootstrap samples, capital B of them. Then you create, uh, so you create a tree. So all these Fs are going to be trees, okay? So while creating a tree, what you do is you 
uh, need to take splits, right? You have the full region and you want to split into two regions and maybe four regions and so on. Okay, depending on which, uh, how to, depending on how many, you know, what, what node, node impurity aspects and so on. Uh, so when you're doing the split, you only allow splits, uh, search over splits over a reduced number of variables. Okay, so you are only allowing. Uh, uh, so let's say you're doing the first split. You have uh, p variables. You're only going to choose m less than p number of variables, where m is, uh, uh, you know, let's say m is like p by two or something. So you only allow five variables to be chosen for the split decision. And what are those five variables? Pick uniformly at random. So just pick five arbitrary ones, uh, arbitrary features to split on on at that uh, in that in that step. Okay. So you have a region you want to split. Instead of looking at all the p dimensions, you look at only let's say m m dimensions and then continue. Okay. So so that's uh, uh, that's the I guess the way to decorrelate the trees. I, it decorrelates the trees because you're now using uh, increasingly less common data across trees. The trees are, don't look common anymore, okay? in the sense that uh, maybe the M features that you chose to split for the first tree, even at the first level, is going to be probably different from the features that you chose to split the first split at the, in the second tree and so on. Okay. Yeah. Do you use, so you pick, let's say you pick five variables. Yeah. Do you use the same five variables to make the whole tree, or do you, at each time you do a split, you pick another five random ones? I mean, in this version that's there in the notes, we split every time. I mean, so we choose every time. We choose five different ones every time. Okay. Uh, if you choose the same ones, then it's like saying I have removed variables from my data, and that's the data being used completely for the tree, which is also okay. Not bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You had a point. Oh, I think I was just clarifying. He was saying at each split of the same tree. Yeah, at each split of the same tree, you could use the same features. That's equivalent to saying I have my original data. I'm dropping a bunch of features, and then uh, doing a tree construction, right? I mean. If you had ten features, you drop the first five features, let's say, and then the next five features is is being used. Uh, this reduced data is being used for tree construction as usual, like in the last lecture. Then that's essentially the same as using, uh, like using the same uh, features for split at every location, as if you know, uh, is equivalent to saying I had full data, but I'm using the same features at every location. It's the same, isn't it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> But anyway, I mean, so in the in the version that's there in the notes, uh, you you do pick split, you know, you rechoose uh, the notes uh, the dimensions that you want to uh, split over. Okay, and uh, that's it. That's that's the one tweak, and it decorrelates the trees a little bit, and helps in uh, further you know getting lower variance estimates. Okay. And so that's it. I did not even write the algorithm, so you can see the. Uh, notes. So who has not understood random forest by this description? Yes. So actually if I have say my data set less than, so first I, this was my understanding, yeah. take five variables and create a tree, with the remaining five variables you create another tree and then take average? Uh, you could do that, so that's fine. So the, so they have, so in the version that I presented now, uh, what you do is you don't do anything. So you, so you just do tree construction, okay? So you have the bootstrap sample, let's say the last one. Uh, you want to construct a tree. While constructing the tree, you do a, this greedy procedure of uh, splitting a region into parts, right? Two parts and so on. So when you do that, you just pick a subset of the variables to split on. That's all. A subset being a M size subset, okay? Now the version you said is also fine, but I don't know if it's called random forest. But it's worth, you know, you could build a tree like that. Yeah. But, you know, the only change from bagging is, or regular tree construction. In bagging, the only thing was the way, the thing that was varying was the data set. It's the same tree construction process, nothing in the algorithm, uh, the construction of F. Here, uh, the construction of each F, uh, uh, in addition to the bag, bag sample, you know, Z star of B, is also the, uh, the choice of split variables. Okay, it's this that's random, or you know, is pruned so that you have more decorrelated trees. Okay, so you're basically trying to reduce the correlation uh, with the hope that it will reduce the variance. So you tie it back to bias variance trade-off. Turns out that uh, bagging uh, a regular decision tree, a single decision tree, a bagging, and maybe random forest have almost the same bias. 
So maybe you can reduce the variance, uh, variance term by doing these, these tricks, OK? Uh, OK, so the only trick is uh, this, the one in the square. So at each split, uh, do m less than p. I mean, pick a subset and do, do splits, OK? Any other question? Why not? <laughs> You're reducing the variance, so you'll never go to the extreme. Why not? The high variance is related to basically when kind of lead to what overfitting. Sure. So if you are controlling variance to some extent. Some extent is the keyword. <laughs> so it will never be like, let's say, a very overfitted. Or... That doesn't follow from the previous statement. Randomness combines both bagging and your random sample. Sure. I mean, we don't know. Any model can overfit, OK? Even linear models can overfit, OK? Let's say there's no relation between x's and y's. And still, a linear model will say, you know, beta is uh, 0.5 for one of the variable, maybe minus 1 for the other variable. can happen. Okay. So let's say if I impute a lot of highly correlated variables in random forest. Impute variables. I have variables yeah. wherein I haven't done any feature transformation or PC or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. And I just run this algorithm out of the box. Yeah. So it will work right because in some of the models, if you don't play around, if you don't reduce the correlation or you yeah. don't drop the variables, yeah. they don't give you good predictions. Right? But since random forest is always taking random samples of your feature space, yeah. It, will give you good prediction. Uh, Can we see that? Like? No. I don't see a way, way to argue that. Maybe if you have a reference, share it on the forum. But tree uh, models generally uh, don't have an issue of multicollinearity, just like, like linear models do. But tree models, as compared to them, don't, right? Because random models is actually considered as a very good out of the back box algorithm where you don't have to do much of the feature transformation at all. Sure. So these statements are the last statement is fine, but I don't know how that influ you know influences or Im implies the previous statement you made. Uh, this multicollinearity business, you know, if you care about prediction, it doesn't matter. Multicollinearity doesn't matter. Okay, you can build linear models with uh, you know almost the same features and therefore coefficients being minus hundred and plus hundred and it's fine. Okay. Only thing is, you know, how do you train it? You can't use probably the inversion formula that we saw, like matrix inverses. You probably have to do gradient descent. But you'll get to a model which will take care of, you know, which will have nothing to do with, you know, which will not in, get influenced by multicollinearity. Okay, so that addresses your point. But uh, yeah, it could be a really good out of the box model. And actually, uh, boosting methods are probably almost the same class. They're also very good. Uh, as I said, I think uh, in terms of rules of thumb, uh, maybe you want to pick some of these complex models and then then reduce the uh, uh, degrees of freedom or reduce the complexity, as in have shorter trees or lesser number of trees and so on, to uh, go from highly overfitted models probably to models which have good test error. Okay, that's a that's a rule of thumb uh, which I guess I advocate. But in general, you can any model can be good, any model can be bad without looking at the data. You cannot say anything, at least in theory. Okay. Uh, any other question? Okay, so now uh, we look at a couple of so so one last point about random forest. Uh, there's this notion of uh, out of bag estimates. Okay, so out of bag samples, let's say. Okay, so. Basically, for each data point x i y i, you basically look at all the trees that were not, did not use this data point. Okay, this is very similar to what we saw in Bootstrap as well. In the Bootstrap, uh, when we were evaluating uh, the performance of, uh, um, now I don't recall what we were doing. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Yeah, so in the bootstrap, there is a way to estimate the uh, validation performance of, a, of, of, a, of the models, right? So remember, for every model, there was data that was not used. So the data that was not used while building that particular sample, bootstrap sample, the data that not feature in that bootstrap sample, therefore was not used for the construction of the model, can be used to score that model. Okay. Similarly, same idea here. If x i y i was not used in a subset of the trees, that those uh, x i y i can be used to score those those trees. Okay. So, um, and this is just a, I guess, a parallel or an alternative for uh, cross validation. Okay. So, but then you really don't have too many choices, right? It's just the uh, tree size or the number of trees, uh, which are the choices. So, you if you do cross validation, you basically are just uh, uh, trying to choose these choices, uh, trying to make choices among these. Okay. And M as well, for example. Okay, so anyway, out of bag samples, we already saw it in Bootstrap uh, lecture, so I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, next, let's directly jump to interpretation. Okay, so interpretation for tree methods uh, and also in general for other methods. Uh, if you recall the first six lectures or so, we were pretty much sticking with linear models, and in linear models, uh, modular multicollinearity issue, you could, I guess, loosely, I guess, in a very offhand way, it's not correct technically, but you could interpret uh, the coefficients of the uh, variables as some sort of a, you know importance of that variable, for example. Okay. Uh, whereas uh, for nonlinear models, it's not really, really clear how to interpret uh, which features were important or not, and so on. Okay. So uh, we'll do that. Uh, so we'll try to do interpretation for you know we'll start with uh, uh, tree tree methods. So this applies for both. Uh, the regular decision tree that we saw in the last lecture, or things like uh, aggregate, aggregated gradient boost decision trees, right, which was just a sum of a bunch of trees, or uh, random forests, or bagging, uh, bag, bag trees. Okay, all of them it will apply. Okay, and uh, and what is that? Uh, that's called the uh, I guess variable importance scores. Um, Okay, is actually, uh, for example, I mean, this is an important topic actually. For random forests, there is this variable importance scores um, and other things. Uh, for example, when you move on to deep neural networks and so on, interpretability even becomes more difficult because it's a highly, you know, it's a bunch of really complex function class, a lot of random functions uh, getting um, convolved, not convolved, but concatenated with each other, um, composed with each other, sorry. And uh, so it's not, it's not clear what's happening with the trained model. So interpretation is a very big uh, interpretation or whatever debugging a model. Train model is always a important topic, right? Uh, so let's look at variable importance scores. So for a single tree, uh, for a variable XL, so let's pick a variable XL. For a single tree, uh, the score, uh, the relevance of that variable is defined as, uh, I guess, I for importance for that uh, for that uh, uh, variable. I L uh, is uh, a sum over uh, T is equal to one to uh, I guess, uh, J of uh, I T times an indicator of whether uh, variable at that T is equal to L. Okay. So what is T? What is T indexing? What is J and all that? So L is the uh, feature, so for, let's say it's an education feature. So maybe it's a, um, maybe it's ordinal. So there is an order relationship between these uh, uh, education, you know, bachelor's, master's, PhD, high school, and so on. Um, then you basically just look at uh, all nodes. So all nodes in the tree. So basically, all the nodes where a split occurred. Okay, and so this this summation is for all nodes in the tree. And this second indicator is just saying all the nodes in the tree where this variable was used to split, okay. And the location where this node was used, so this uh, the tree was split based on this variable, okay. Uh, the region was split in uh, based on this variable L. I'll have a score which is improvement, okay. It's I, I of t is just uh, some sort of an improvement score. It's positive, okay. So what is that improvement? It's just the 
difference between the, for example, think of regression tree, then it's just a difference between uh, the sum of squares in the two uh, regions that I got from the split versus the sum of squares, uh, sorry, the, yeah, sum of squares uh, score for before the split, okay? The difference between those two, that's the improvement, okay? So hopefully by splitting, you have reduced the sum of squares uh, value. So maybe the previous value minus the sum of the two next ones, okay? That's the, that's the improvement, okay? It's just a difference between the node impurity scores before the split minus uh, the sum of the node impurity scores after the split, okay? So that's, a, I mean, you can change these things. This is just one way to define uh, importance um, uh, and the total importance, okay, of that variable. So that's how I've, uh, that's how you would define the importance for uh, a variable, okay? And once you can do this, you can do this for every variable and you'll get uh, these scores, right? Uh, then what you can do is, uh, uh, for simplicity, you can just normalize them to be between uh, zero to 100, you know, whatever, some normalization. You can, so any, the variable, you just sort the scores, you know, there will be a variable with some high score, maybe 5.7, uh, maybe there's a variable with low score, maybe 1.1. You just make the 5.7 multiplied with the number such that 5.7 is now 100, okay? Then all the numbers uh, are get multiplied by the same scaling factor. And that, then that's essentially the variable importance uh, uh, plot, okay, relative importance plot, okay. Uh, J is the set of all uh, nodes in a tree, not the leaves, not including the leaves, okay. All the internal nodes, basically. Everywhere we, where you did a split is where you can measure what happened before and after the split. The random points will do it for multiple trees, right? Yes, yeah, so right now I just described it for a single decision tree, yeah. So is, is the idea for a single decision tree fine? Any, any questions about what's happening? So the tree is already like, we already did the tree construction, tree pruning, whatever, we got the tree. Now we are just asking at what locations, what variable was used for a split, okay? Maybe a variable was used at so many locations. Then we're just asking at each location where it was used, what's the relative improvement that it got, got us, okay? Maybe before the split, there was some uh, root means, you know, uh, mean square error. And after the split, there were two mean square errors because there are two regions. Uh, the difference between these two, you know, is the, basically the improvement that this split uh, split on this variable got us. Okay, and we're just adding them all together. And I, the last point I made was just scale them so that you know one of one number is hundred and all the other numbers are related to that. Okay, so in the notes there is a example uh, example for uh, a prediction task involving uh, the California housing data set. Okay, you can have a look at that plot. Is that fine? Any questions? Just one. Yeah. Um, did you say how you should pick your minimum node size? Do you do that like cross validation or is that a user specified parameter? Minimum node size. Right. I'm sorry, I was looking at your notes for the forest tree. Okay, where is that? When you're building an individual tree in your random forest. Oh, minimum node size. Right. So like how many uh, how many observations could be in a week? Oh yeah, yeah. So that's not Minimum, is it called minimum? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's, that's a termination stopping criteria. Remember when we were constructing trees, we have to stop somewhere. We can always keep splitting, splitting, splitting till one of the leaves is empty or something like that. That's, that's too much of a split, you know. You just wanna split. So you only wanna, so in terms of a stopping criteria, this is a useful criteria where you only wanna split when the number of data points falling into that region is uh, large enough. So if it's, if the number of po data points of my training data falling into a region that I'm considering to split is already like two or four, then splitting it further will land two, you know, two points into one side, maybe one point on the other side. So it's really small. So you kind of terminate or stop your tree splitting procedure when uh, the number of points in the particular split, you know, location where you plan to split is too too small. That's that's some that's a, that's your choice. Oh, it's a, yeah, it's your choice. There is no, uh, I guess, it's a design choice, just like. Uh, um, just like in random forest, there are other things to choose, like the number of trees and uh, things like that. Yeah, good question. Any other question? Do yeah. We, do we provide these splitting? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Do we have these pruning criteria even for random forest? Because we don't generally prune the tree in random forest. Uh, oh, it doesn't say. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, so there is. A, I mean, so here there is a stopping criteria. Yeah, there is no pruning. I think happening in in the algorithm description. But you could prune, it's, uh, it's up to you. <laughs> yeah, 
so in this the version, the algorithm version we have, we only have to specify the minimum node size, as in the minimum number of points in the node where we stop splitting to stop the criteria. So the, you just can define a criteria, and you can always do a post-processing. It's fine. And you may not want to do a post-processing. That's also fine. I don't know what the best practice is, if you're asking that question. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. I mean, this is all, you know, there's a certain construction way of getting to a classifier. It's anyway nonlinear. It's an aggregation of a lot of other, you know, a lot of nonlinear classifiers anyway. So theoretically, it's kind of hard to say anything. I mean, there are, of course, papers which discuss these things, but I don't know. Yes. So, so you're going to go to this sort of variable by variable in, in the tree, all the variables used in the tree. And, yeah, and not variable by variable, every split. So draw the tree. Split, right. Yeah, every split location. And, and yeah. the ones that uh, give you the greatest improvement are going to be the more important ones in general, right? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm aggregating over all. Yeah, that's true. So, that's so if the I, ITs are high, for this variable XL, let's say XL is like for education, as I was saying. Let's say education variable is being split at more, many locations, and at every location that was used, it really gave us a lot of improvement. The relate, you know, the comparison, the mean square error thing. Uh, then probably it's highly more important. That's the idea. And so my question is though, if you do all those calculations and then you yeah. normalize all the variables, don't you lose that? Uh, oh, by normalization, I just mean like multiply it with a scalar, multiply it with some number so that the largest, the most important one is like 100 or something. It's just for visualization purpose. Oh, right. so forget about, you know, the normalization is not very useful as a conceptual idea. Yeah. So if you see the plot in the in the notes, uh, one of the variables has like important score 100. Okay. Why, you know, why, were, why did it magically become 100? It didn't. It was whatever number it was times something to get it to 100. Okay, so so that's variable importance. That's a way to kind of uh, yeah. How does the variable we compare change with lasso? Like as you so you do a random for it. Later you do lasso, then you get the similar results. Variable importance. Lasso variable importance. What is variable importance for lasso? Yeah. You also string the variables, right? Lasso. What do we do with the variables? I mean, if you perform lasso, you will get a model potentially with a lesser number of non-zero coefficients than if you if you did not do lasso. As in, if you did not regularize with an L1 regularizer, the, the regularization term, you will get a linear model, but maybe more coefficients are closer to zero or actually zero. Yeah. But what do you do with that then? Assuming so, late, assuming so uh, out of like 100 variables, you got like 10 or 15 which are in. Yeah. Yeah. Then you do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do we get like same set of variables or? Good question. I don't have an idea. As in, I don't have. I cannot say anything a priori. You may get the same. You may not get the same. Uh, I mean, it's a result of two computational procedures. Whether the results are the same depends on the input instance. Okay. The, I I think we can construct instances where you will get the same answer. But uh, in general, I, I don't know, a priori. <laughs> Any other question? I think we're going a bit slow. Let's uh, move forward. So the next uh, way to interpret uh, nonlinear models is through uh, what are called partial dependence plots, OK? OK, but even before I get there, so when did you guys see random forest? Was it recently taught in 572 or? Yeah. Last semester. OK. Uh, so partial dependence plot. So we want to understand. Uh, so partial dependence plot. So OK, there's plots part of it. But uh, it's basically trying to break, a, you know, think of f as a pre-trained, you know, trained model, maybe a random forest model. You break your bunch of variables into xs and xc, OK? I mean, excess is a, some some preferred variables. Okay. Um, so, for example, uh, I guess age, education, income, whatever. So maybe these two are my uh, excess. Okay. So excess is a collection of variables. Okay. Um, and income and uh, something else. 
uh, they're all everything else basically so the xx union xc is going to be all my variables essentially uh, so i'm going to in fact restrict my set you know my set of variables xs to one or two okay because i want to plot them i want to visualize things so if i do that um, then the partial dependence of of f of x what is x x is nothing but the union of xs and xc these two sets of features okay like uh, as i said xs could be these two and xc could be everything else okay partial dependence of f of x on those you know on the set of features maybe you know age and education which is nothing but xs is uh, given by f s of i mean just notation but it's just uh, it's given by uh, the expectation with respect to everything else of f of x okay or oh, actually everything else so basically you had a bunch of other variables tons of other variables you only care about uh, um, uh, two variables as age and education then you basically are averaging out all the other variables okay all the other coordinates i mean in other words you just uh, i mean this is essentially equivalent to 1 by n sum over i is equal to 1 to n of uh, f of uh, xs that's not substituted yet and uh, all the other variables so x i only at the c part okay so all i'm saying is that the partial dependence right it can be evaluated by averaging out these other columns which are not not relevant in my you know in my set xs okay so this gives us so now this is a function in two dimensions if it's a function in two dimensions you can plot it okay you can have x coordinate y coordinate and in the z coordinate you can have the evaluation of the function so you can actually see how the function looks like as a function of these two coordinates when you've averaged out everything else okay that's called a partial dependence plot it's just slicing the function you know it's just slicing the function into lower dimensions essentially in a certain way okay uh, we are uh, taking the uh, nominal value so it's like saying uh, instead of you know i have my let's say two features age and ed education so age is let's say 10 numbers 10 unique values in this data set let's say and education is five unique values then uh, all i want to compute is f of s which is going to be uh, 10 times 5 you know for every pair of inputs i just need to get a number what i'm trying to do is for every pair of age and education value i am uh, substituting the expected it's not exactly this way but i'm substituting the expected value of the other features it's not you know if, if you get that intuition then we are doing something similar here it's like saying what is the most you know let's say for income what is the expected income you know just substitute that it's not exactly the, what we're doing here but if you get that idea uh, so using age and education to get a kind of basically predicted value of income no no we just want to understand the dependence of our prediction function on age and education that's what that's the goal we want to understand our function first of all the nonlinear function right so we want to understand how does it behave with respect to a couple of features let's say age and education then uh, what would be uh, one intuitive way one intuitive thing you could do is okay there are hundreds of, hundreds of other features let me just uh, substitute the average value of every other feature okay which means that for in income uh, let me just substitute the average income there let me substitute the average uh, something else there okay for every other values you know if i substitute all the other correct values then i get i know how this function behaves with respect to the first two coordinates by age and education by changing now age and education i can look at the three dimensional graph you know in this case 3d plot right now instead of substituting uh, uh, the average value so what i the version i said is essentially doing this right so it's basically f of xs and then substituting the average for um, 1 by n average of income 1 by n average of some other feature and so on right so this is the version i said uh, we are just doing the averaging outside the <laughs> function call okay it's like averaging out the function itself okay is that not clear it's basically okay let's see uh, yeah so basically uh, think of uh, um, several functions uh, i don't know how to draw this but let's say there's a there's a function which is 
you know, let's say this is a function, you know, in 3D, okay? Depends on x1, x2, two features. This is the function. Uh, think of uh, having multiple such functions, okay? So, um, and maybe one more. You're just averaging out the functions, essentially. But you're only averaging out over one of the coordinates, x2, so that you can get uh, the functional dependency only on x1. So you will get some, some dependency on x1, where you've removed the, uh, you know, you've substituted the average value of x2, so it's a constant. So you're not, you're not plotting the third dimension because it uh, doesn't matter. Uh, I, I hope I didn't confuse you further. But it's just, uh, so if you, did you understand this idea where I just averaged each feature and substitute that value? Instead of that, I'm averaging uh, my function at every every value of the uh, remaining features. Okay. okay, so that was, uh, yeah. So that was partial dependence plots. Those are two ways to interpret uh, uh, any model that you've constructed, any nonlinear model you've constructed. Uh, uh, variable importance, yeah, can be used, maybe can be used even beyond decision trees. You just have to figure out what is importance, that improvement aspect, okay. Uh, next, uh, let's look at uh, look at uh, another nonlinear model called multivariate multivariate adaptive regression splines. Okay. So, how many of you have heard of this method? One. Not now, of course. I just said the name, but two people have seen it before. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So. I'm going to go through multivariate adaptive regression splines only because uh, it's an interesting way to understand uh, model construction. And you'll see that it's also, again, uh, uh, forward stage-wise array to model. Uh, you know, it belongs to that model family, OK? So it's an interesting construction procedure. And it has some intuition as well, uh, which so what is the goal of this model? This is going to be for class for regression. So the previous discussion about random forests, uh, it's applicable for both classification regression just because trees are applicable for both classification regression. You just have to take majority vote in one case and uh, just averaging on the other case, okay? Uh, so this is for regression. And uh, it's gonna use a set C of functions, okay? Set, uh, let's call it script C of uh, functions, okay? To build the final model. The final model will be of the form sum over, it's called beta m hm of x. Okay, the final model will be additive. Okay, it's some coefficient times uh, some uh, function hm. Okay, uh, these hms, these these uh, uh, mth function is hm. So uh, these each of these functions will be derived from some base family of functions, okay? This is, uh, let's say, base functions, okay? Base as in like uh, core functions, or initial starting functions, okay? Uh, so what are these functions? So think of uh, two functions, uh, two one-dimensional functions, x minus a positive, and a minus x positive, okay? This is, I mean, so what are these functions? There's nothing but max of uh, 0 comma x minus a and max of uh, 0 comma a minus x. That's a short form for writing instead of max and 0, okay? And in, uh, in a diagram, this is what it looks like. So it's a one-dimensional function. So think of a as this point. Uh, then one of the functions is gonna be like this. Okay, this is that x minus a positive. And the second function will be symmetric, you know, exactly the opposite. Okay, this is the second function. Okay, these are the two functions. Okay, this is uh, a minus x. Basically non-zero when uh, x is smaller than a, let's say the dark shaded one, and it's uh, exactly equal to x minus a when x is positive, okay? 
So think of functions like this. So C, our base function, is going to be based on data. The data is going to be our data matrix X, which is n times p, right? Our data matrix has n, time, n times p size, which means that it has n times p numbers. So I'm going to create functions, which are going to be exactly uh, with A's substituted with the n times p numbers. What do I mean by that? So I'll create a, a function which is x minus, uh, it's a little x11 positive, okay? Uh, actually, let me just, it's the first coordinate, I'm gonna choose it as uh, one. Okay, so what am I doing here? I'm gonna pick, so I'm gonna create functions based on my data. My data has n times p uh, numbers in there, right? So let me pick the numbers corresponding to the first column, okay? Which means that for every observation, just pick the first first uh, uh, first coordinate, okay? So the first first observations, first coordinate, let's call it x11. So first observation, first coordinate. Let's the next coordinates, next uh, next co next observations, first coordinate be x21, okay? I'm gonna pick A's to be these numbers. These are known numbers, right? Five, three, whatever. Now the first coordinate is gonna be just the x1 coordinate. X1 coordinate is just a scalar, so I'm just calling it the x1 coordinate to to reference the first uh, first uh, column of my feature ve feature vector x. Okay, it's n n dimension. Sorry, it's p dimensional feature vector. So the first generic feature vector dimension, I'm calling it x1. That's a scalar, so I can instead of little x, I can just use capital X1. Same thing. Okay. So I did that for the first uh, feature. I can do the same thing for any feature, right? So for a generic feature xj. I can say xj minus x, ij, positive. Ith observation, jth feature, okay, some number is there. So xj minus xij are positive, okay. So why did I use xj, x1s here? Is so that I can call them actually not just one dimensional functions, but actually uh, uh, the full p dimensional function. So what do I mean by that? So Think of a so think of a function whose input is a p-dimensional vector, okay. But what it will actually do is, given the p-dimensional vector, ignore all dimensions except the jth dimension. Take that value. The function is parameterized by this a. In this case, it's x i j. Subtract it from that and see whether it's positive or negative, and output either um, x j minus x i j or zero. Okay. So it's basically you know it's a function where it's ignoring all the p minus one coordinates except for the coordinate, okay? So it's a, it's a function on the full input feature vector, okay? Anyway, so how many such functions are there? There are gonna be n times uh, p functions like this, okay? So these are my base functions, okay? So all these, I mean, these are, I guess, called, uh, I think we discussed this, these are called hinge functions. They just uh, are ReLU nonlinearity, if you have seen deep learning, uh, this is called uh, rectified linear units, okay? Um, okay, so we have these base functions. Now what we're gonna do is figure out how to construct uh, HM, those, those functions which will add to our uh, linear model, okay? So I guess the R part is regression. Uh, splines are these, these, uh, these guys are called splines as well, okay? There are many other uh, you know, splines uh, as well, but uh, these uh, these hinge functions are also called splines. And uh, multivariate is just multidimensional. Um, adaptive is because you're adding functions, uh, HMs one at a time, so you are taking into account what happened previously. So you, you know, okay, so the difference between forward stages additive modeling and uh, all these uh, regression, so what is it called, random forest methods that we saw, is that in forward stages additive modeling, it's sequential. We add the first m minus one models, and then because of the you know additional errors being made, uh, same thing with gradient boosting decision trees as well. We are trying to take care of the additional error. Okay, so there's it's inherently sequential. First we add the add a few trees, for example in gradient boosted decision tree, then we figure out which new tree to add. Okay, whereas in random forest it's not sequential. You can it's just parallel. You just once you create the bootstrap uh, bootstrap samples, you just construct trees in parallel in the sense that one doesn't depend on the other. Okay. So, but here we're again gonna go back to this adaptive business or I guess adaptive boosting or adaboost style where you first create the first M minus one, uh, these HM functions, and then uh, depending on them, you add one more function, okay? Uh, 
so that's good. Okay. Okay. So the way we're going to add functions is uh, is as follows. So first uh, we have uh, remember our set C has uh, n times p functions, right? These uh, x minus a plus and uh, a minus a sorry a minus x plus type of functions, right? Uh, let's call the script m just a mess script m to be a set of uh, these hm functions, okay? I mean, initially it's empty in the sense we haven't added any function to our, uh, you know, our model. Okay. What we're going to do is uh, add. So let's say initially this is empty, or maybe there's a constant function for simplicity. It doesn't matter. Um, what we're going to do is uh, look at all uh, functions. That can be so. Initially, let's say we have uh, nothing in our set. Okay, script m is empty. Oops, it doesn't matter. Okay, uh, let's say initially script m is empty. Uh, we'll first add. Okay, first add pair of functions. Such that rusty of sum of squares is minimized. Okay. By which I mean, uh, let's say initially you don't have any functions. All I'm saying is pick two functions from uh, this set script C. Okay, of this form, we saw these are hinge functions. Okay. Pair because uh, you know, for each xi, oops, actually there is a, I think there's supposed to be two times n times p. I mean, there's a plus and there's also also a x minus uh, xij the plus, okay? There's two two functions with the, with the same parameter. Anyway, uh, you pick two functions, this, this pairs, which minimizes the mean square error or residual sum of squares. Okay, is that clear? So you're just picking. So for every, so you have np pairs of uh, these x plus a, x minus a plus and uh, a minus x plus. So you have np such pairs. Take the first one. Look at the mean square error. If you, if you, which means that you know, pick the first pair of functions. Find the find let's say beta one, beta one for the first function, beta two for the second function. Such that uh, mean square, you know, our residual sum of squares is uh, minimized. That will be the first number. Similarly, you take the second pair of functions, which is uh, you know x minus a prime plus and x minus a prime. I guess um, and you'll get a different beta one, beta two prime. It'll give you a residual sum of squares two, and and so on. Whichever pair gives you the lowest residual sum of squares, pick that as your pair of functions. Put them in put them in script m. Okay. As a running example, let's say in the in this uh, example, maybe uh, it's an example here. Yeah. So so maybe x. Uh, x2 minus uh, x72 plus and uh, x72 minus x2 plus were the first pair of functions to be added to my script m set. Okay, this is the first pair of functions which minimize the residual sum of squares. Now, in the next step, we have we have uh, two functions in here. Okay, now we need to create the next hm. Okay, h3. Okay, h3 and h4. Because we added two functions here, let's call this h, h1 and h2. 
and we want to add h3 and h4, okay? So what would be the candidate functions there? The candidate functions would be all functions which can be multiple, which can be either the original functions, which is from the set C, or products of the original functions with this functions, with the, with the functions already in M, okay? By which I mean, you could have either functions like this, x2 minus x72 plus times maybe uh, x1 minus x51 plus, for example, this could be one possible candidate for h3 and then h4 would be uh, same thing, x2 minus um, x72 plus times uh, x51 minus x1 plus, okay? This could be h4, okay? All I'm saying is in each step, you have two sets, base set of functions and the functions that you've already included from before, right? The script m, okay? Which is, uh, let's say an m is equal to uh, two. So you've already added two functions, which are, let's, let's say these two. The idea is the next set of functions that I'm gonna add, the next uh, two functions that I'm gonna add, either are the original functions or they, the original functions multiplied with the previous functions that I already have, okay? So I'm, I'm increase, I'm either adding more complex functions as the product of these hinge functions, or I'm adding the original, you know, single hinge functions, okay? So I need to add functions iteratively, right? I mean, this is an additive process. This is a, so in this slide, I'm just trying to say how we add, add the functions. Either we add the functions, original functions that we defined, that we said were like this, hinge functions, right? These types of functions. Or we add those hinge functions multiplied by previous functions that we've already added in our set, okay? That's it. There's just a one way to construct uh, you know, more complex functions which are dependent on previous functions. So previously some functions were included. Now you're adding these additional functions. And if you, you are trying to figure out which functions to add to minimize the residual sum of squares. So when you minimize the residual sum of squares, it depends on what functions were already there before, okay? If already certain hinge functions were there, which were reaching some residual sum of squares, adding additional functions of certain type, you know, which depend on this previous ones only will reduce the residual sum of squares properly. Okay, so there's dependence, uh, sequential dependence. But otherwise, the, the type of functions that we're adding are essentially products, right? Uh, something like x1 minus, let's call it a1 plus, uh, times uh, a2 minus uh, x5 plus, times, uh, let's say, a10 minus uh, x11, whatever, plus. So you have functions which look like products of hinges, okay? So what, so, okay, we did this messy, complicated construction of, uh, additive functions, they all look like uh, products of, you know, hinges. So what's, uh, what's the intuition, right? Why are we doing this? So the intuition for building this family of additive functions is because the hinge functions are uh, sufficiently, I would say, what's the right word? Yeah, they tend to be non-zero in, in, in fairly small regions of the input space, okay? So first of all, hinge function for one dimension, it's non-zero only on the first half of the input space. I mean, let's say the right half of the input, input space for that coordinate. When you multiply that in two dimensions, right? If you have two hinge functions, one is non-zero uh, like this. The other one is, uh, okay. The first hinge function is non-zero in this way, let's say. Second hinge function is non-zero in this way. Then the product would be non-zero only in this region, okay? So, the products of hinge functions are non-zero in very small locations, I guess not small locations, but smaller areas of the input. And uh, they get multiplied by betas as well, right? In the linear, in, when you add the, uh, when you add it to the model. So they're able to capture local aspects of the uh, true regression function, okay? They're able to capture local aspects of uh, this conditional expectation of uh, y given x, right? Remember? So they're able to capture that. That's, that's the intuition for why these types of functions, okay? That's, that's the intuition for building this design, but you could have 100 different designs and you can have different ways to add functions, yeah. So on the previous page, on the second step, yeah. um, does it have to include the uh, set of functions that you already have chosen in the first step? Yeah, we have, so what the, mo the functions that we have chosen in the first step, they're never deleted. All right, 
So either you keep them or you do some kind of transformation only with No, we always keep them. So HM, so previous whatever steps, the functions we added will always be there. Now we're asking what is the new two new pair of functions. Here we're instead of adding one function, we're adding two. Only because you know there's you know the symmetry here. If you add this this type of hinge function, you also can consider the other function. I mean that's just a design choice here. Right. But yeah. you can theoretically include uh, a different set of functions, but just multiply it by the first one that you've chosen already, right? Multiply you could multiply, right. yeah. Either so you could either get a base function which is just one one hinge, or you can multiply that hinge with the previous guys and see if that reduces your residual sum of squares further. Yeah, that's all. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, when do you stop this algorithm? This design choice, that capital M there, uh, you can just choose it to be something like 100, okay? Or also it could be data dependent, like uh, till the error is some value, or error is not decreasing too much relative to previous function versus the next function being added, you know? So you can do things like that. And that's true for all forward stages added model, modeling techniques, yeah. Um, any other question? Okay, so, so, okay, so let's take a break for 10 minutes. And uh, next, after this, I'm gonna talk about support vector machines. As in, basically the innovation there would be, you know, yeah, it's the linear, we'll start with linear models. Eventually, SVMs also are nonlinear, but uh, the main point there would be uh, a geometric construction of the loss function, okay?